So first, does anybody have any follow-up questions from the last club? Did anybody try writing more canons this week? Does anybody just have anything they want to ask about? I don't want to go into a lot of lengths, but I, I tried and uh, I tried to withhold from watching your your solution to the to the wires, mm -hmm. and I felt that I I know I was like it, it was difficult for me once I started filling in the voices to have freedom with the other voices because I felt like. Uh, every movement that I could think of will be like, I don't know, it will clash against what, what I already wrote. And the, I know it's difficult. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so are you saying that the wires helped or did you find that the wires, did you try doing any cannons without the wires? I mean, in theory, they really help. And I completely agree with the idea. I like the idea a lot, mm -hmm. but in practice, I couldn't really like, uh, uh, Yes, get, get into uh, the, the right place. But I think it's just because I, I, I'm not there in, in skill. Okay. <laughs> it's just, mm -hmm. I need more time. But, but I tried and, and it was difficult. Yeah, I see now your, your solution. I didn't want to get influenced by it. So I, I, and I think it's very clever the way you, you use the, the typical texture with parallel thirds and six. Mm -hmm. It's basically, well, yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. well, you know, I find that if you're having a lot of issues with like the consequences of your follower um, imposing upon your leader, uh, that's often because of things like not enough stepwise motion, or sometimes it's just too busy. Um, and just remember, my one of my biggest pieces of advice is that people think that busy counterpoint is in good counterpoint with busy counterpoint. But if you just take a step back and think more broadly, busy counterpoint is in better counterpoint with still counterpoint. Um, so if you have a lot of motion and if you have a lot of leaps and the other voice is doing the same thing, it's kind of like everybody's doing really extensive dance moves and you're going to step on some toes. Uh, so just consider, you know, maybe doing more stepwise motion if that's not, and if that's not the case, then we can take a look at it. Um, yeah, it just, it just takes practice. And that's, that's partially, so my background in studying this and why I came up with this, why I started with canons, by the way, was that I was a performance major. I studied violent performance. And violin, I mean, performers, we all have this regimen where you wake up, you practice several hours a day, and you sound like crap at the end of it. And then you repeat the next day, and you sound like crap again. And you do it for months. And then if you do it enough times, and you do it well enough, um, eventually you might sound good. And so the purpose of these canons is so that you can practice composition and counterpoint like you practice an instrument. Every day, a regimen, and eventually you will notice mysteriously, even though you might not be great at canons, everything else will improve. Uh, fugues, inventions, free counterpoint as well, your variations and everything. And I know a lot of people here can actually attest to that uh, quality of them. Um, so that being said, I just, I would encourage you just to keep practicing them. And the, the, you're, you're in, you're in what, you know, is like the beginner's hell of, of canons, you know, we call it beginner's hell. Um, but it will get better and it will get easier. And there's a certain, certain fluidity that you will obtain. Um, Juan, do you have anything you want to say to that actually? Because you're, you're a veteran canon writer now because you, you had this you had the experience of being a great contrapuntist and then suddenly you had to write canons. You know, and you you were already you were already pretty good at it, but like you you had to practice and get really good at your fluency that you have now. Um, I think when we started doing the um, exercises together, the timed exercises, that it's just like um, opened a whole new dimension to 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 this like bringing the 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 um help me out here the uh, practice from you know like the the practice regimen from the performance world bringing that into composition that was like um eye-opening i think um when when i started writing canons i thought well you know i've already written fugues and inventions and i've done like like i've incorporated like i've incorporated canons in other of my pieces but i hadn't like really strictly like written um canons canons and inversions canons at intervals and so on and, like it really gets your your ability to do everything else like much much sharper so yeah yeah it's a, it's a remarkable approach cool
All right, so what I always do is I set the timer for 10 minutes as a warm up. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put three wires up here. Um, you can use them or you don't have to use them at all. I made an extra wire for today. The third one, if you can't see it well, just let me know. And I'm going to set the timer for 10 minutes. And you guys can go ahead and use wires or you can write your own cannons. And let's just keep it at a unison for right now. And you have 10 minutes starting now. All right, so enjoy. There goes the timer. Okay, how was that? Any questions about that? All good. Time flies by very fast. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not writing any, I'm, I'm just leaving this up here so I can't write any cannons while you guys use the wire. But for me, it goes by very slow. But I know the feeling when you're writing a cannon in 10 minutes, it goes by very quickly. So that's just the warm up. And in the interest, because we have a lot to cover today, usually I'll take a look at the warm ups, usually one or two of them. Uh, but today, what we're going to do is we're going to look at our warm ups maybe at the end. Um, we're going to go right into the new concept today. And the new concept that we're going to cover, we're going to cover a couple new concepts today. First, modulation. Two, catenation. Three, cryptic form. And then we're also going to look at something called cannons in the wild. All right, we're going to start with modulation. All right, and that's going to require that we learn some technical terms about the cannon, which might not be so fun. Um, but first, Juan, can I call you up to the, uh, to the piano to perform the modulating cannon? OK, cool. I've got the modulating cannon up here. And I just want, this is an extreme cannon of modulations. And I'll show you how it's done a little bit. This is just to prove concept. All right, and I'm going to scroll as he plays. That is an extreme example. We went from C major to E flat major to F major to G major. Very, it sounds like Mario got to the end, you know? Um, so, what we're going to talk about is how to modulate. And we're not going to do any extreme, we, we can do extreme modulations like this. But before we do that, we're going to have to break down the anatomy of the canon because being able to modulate in a canon is an extremely tricky thing, but also a very important thing. The art uh, so first, just some terms, and we're just going to use very basic things. All right, let's say that I have my leader says circle. All right, and every time we have a repetition, we're going to say that this is a phase. And now my follower is going to copy it. Now that goes into phase two. All right. And for the duration that the circle exists, we're going to call this a cycle. All right. So a phase is the rate at which we copy. And a cycle is the duration for which a piece of musical material exists. So in the next phase, let's say that the leader says triangle. All right. That is phase two. And now the follower is also going to say triangle. All right, that is phase three. But notice that is only the second cycle. The triangle exists for this amount of time. And we go on and we go on and see so this is cycle two. All right, and this is gonna be really important to understand for modulations. So let's say that I have a canon in C major. All right, I'm just gonna say that this is the canon in C major. And let's say at some point, let's say that these are my cycles, uh, these are my phases. I'm just gonna say the phase is one measure long. Let's say here, I want to go to G major. And let's say that this is a can at the unison, which means that the accidentals have to carry perfectly. So what has to happen? Well, what we have to do is we have to go to the phase immediately preceding the modulation. To go to the phase preceding the modulation. So this is phase four. All right, we have to go to the follower. We have to go to the leader. Why do we have to go to the leader? Because if the leader does something here, let's say that it does a triangle, 
That means the follower is going to do a triangle here. So that forms a cycle. But what happens if the star, sorry, I called it a triangle. What happens if the star before the modulation doesn't get along with the star after the modulation? What if this can only be in C major and this is also in C major? How are we going to go to G major? So we have to find a star that works both in C major and in G major. And all we have to do for that is omit the cross relationship. So what is the cross relationship between C major and G major? That is, what is the chromatically different note? Anybody? The F, F sharp. F sharp, yeah. Three people said it. Cool. All at the same time. At least that's what I heard. All right. So very logically, all you have to say is that this star right here in phase four can have no F in C. So that way you don't get a clash between F, sorry, between F natural and the, fo the follower and the F sharp that you'll need to take us to G major. And that's all it is, all right? Now this concept is gonna get far more advanced as we go to canons at intervals and if you want to do really mod uh, advanced modulation. So there's this method that we can use called the ruler method. And this is just to keep things really clear. That was a really easy modulation. So let me just write it out like this. So let's say that we have our leader. What we're gonna do is we're gonna write out the scale of the old key, the C major. And now what we've got is our follower. And now we write out the scale according to the interval of imitation. So since this is at a unison, it's going to be the same scale. Make sure you line up your pitches. Just like that. All right. And then what I'm going to come do is I'm going to come down here. I'm going to say modulated follower. All right. And this is going to be. I'm going to keep it at the same interval, so C is imitated with C. But what is different is we have the F sharp. And all we do is we find the cross relationship between these two. Here it is F and F sharp. So we trace them, we connect them, we trace it back up to the leader, and that tells us that we cannot have F natural in the leader. Now this is this is pretty simple. You know, this, and we only need one accidental way. And mastering this is really all you need to do is, is to really get into the genre of the Baroque and writing these, these canons. But we're not going to limit ourselves to that. As we saw with that canon that I just had Juan perform, what happens if, let's say that, now I'm going to show you an extreme example. Let's say that I have, sorry, a leader in C major. Let's say that I want to do it in a contrary motion. It's going to be tonal contrary motion, which we're going to get to later. Don't worry. All right, so I'm going to write it out like that. That's the kind of imitation. And now, let's say that I want to go to E flat major. All I'm going to do is I'm going to write this out. I'm going to say E flat major. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to just find the cross relationships. So here, E flat and E, B flat and B, A flat and A. And I can take these up. All right. And here I find out that I cannot have the pitches E, A, and B in the follower, which so happens to also work as it, as it was in, in, in at the unison, which is an interesting property of uh, contrary motion. But you know, if I did it at a different interval, the pitches would change. And so this is what the ruler is really useful for if you want to modulate to really far away keys with really tricky cannons that are at weird intervals. Like if you want to do a cannon at the seventh or something like that, or a cannon in, in the contrary motion. So that's what the ruler is for. So what I would love for us to do is I'm going to set 
the timer for about, let's see, I think you only need eight minutes, maybe five minutes. What you're going to do is you're just going to write a free bar canon. And on the third bar, we're going to modulate one accidental way, let's say a sharp. Right, go from C major to G major. And all that tells you is that we're going to write your leader here. Actually, you know what? I'll just say this. Write your leader here. Copy it over here. And now, we're just going to say no F. And then, we're going to write your new leader there. And then you can do this. All right? I'm sorry, I should be copied in red. We're going to copy it over here, and then it's going to take us and it's going to modulate us to the new place. Or whatever's going on there. All right, cool. So you're just omitting the cross relationships between, uh, between the leader and the follower so you can execute a modulation. Now, if you want to get really fancy, you can go more than one accidental way. You are welcome to do three accidental, four accidentals. I don't care as long as you understand the concept of the method. All right, so I'm going to just set the timer because this is only three bars. I'm going to set it for five and a half minutes. A little edge on it. All right. If there aren't any questions, I'll go ahead and start it now. And I'm going to leave this up there so you can see how it works. And just remember, no F in the phase immediately preceding the modulation or measure in this case. Cool. All right. So how was that? Does anybody have any questions about how that works? Did it work for you? My advice is whenever doing these exercises, don't try to make them good. Just try to understand the concept and work on them later. So any, any questions about how that works? Uh, can I make uh, two questions? Yeah. First of all, uh, is there a way uh, to be sure in advance that the modulation that works nicely on the paper will sound nice uh, and, um, you know, uh, timely as well? Timely, I don't think it's, it may be the right word, but um not uh, uh Im immature mm -hmm. ah in the immature that's that's an interesting statement actually because i've always thought modulating to the dominant or the subdominant it's amazing how simple they are yet how terrible they can sound uh because they can sound you know you know it's like oh it's, it's it sounds very immature yeah absolutely um I can't, <clears throat> well, one, I can't tell you how to avoid that. Like pretty much you're saying, how not to, how do you not sound corny? Um, only, I, the only thing I can tell you there is just uh, being really strict with your taste and music. And I had that same problem. It's a very mysterious thing. I can't give you any technical advice about that. Um, all I can say about your timing issue though, uh, modulations, you know, here we, it was just a proof of concept, but modulations are important structural events. They're not just local things. They're actually structural events, like often cadences and stuff. So to determine where to do the modulation is a matter of proportion within the larger form. You'll notice with these wireframes, I'll just go ahead and bring them up. Um, the wireframes are designed very specifically with a certain form in mind. They're all eight bars. The modulation always takes place halfway through. And now you understand why it says no C there, because it's going to be major. And it's very strict not because all modulations have to be this way, but as an exercise, they're trying to teach you to modulate when you want to modulate or you have to modulate. You don't want to get bullied by your cannon and modulate when you think, think the cannon wants to modulate. You want to control the cannon rather than the cannon controls you. That's the point of these rulers is to teach you that. Um, but regarding timing, timing, at least for me, is a matter of proportion and form when it comes to modulation. And the proportion in these is always you know, halfway, you know, they're, they're bisected by the modulation. Um, does that answer your question? Yes, it uh, gives some guidelines. And the second is, uh, in which degree are we allowed to uh, sharpen on or flatten some notes? For example, uh, I'm not I'm not sure if there is in the Goldbergs, but Bach would have a D, and um, the follower would have a D sharp, for example. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah is this allowed? Yeah. Yeah, he has some weird cross relationships. Like I think in the first, um, in the first canon, there's actually a C against the C sharp within like the first within a beat. They don't happen at the same time, but he, he does that. 
Um, the Goldberg variations, actually, that's, that's a criticism I have of them pedagogically. I'm not saying that they're not good, but he tends to flip back and forth between the accidentals. He does F sharp and he does F natural, F sharp, F natural, F sharp, F natural, F sharp, F natural. Um, and that's a fine thing to do. It's just pedagogically, it's not that useful. It's like you want to introduce the accidental and you want to keep with it. And then students, once they've mastered it, can play around with it like that. Um, regarding, you know, you, you asked what degree? Um, I, I asked regarding the imitation, which might not be as strict as uh, the uh, canon. So the thing is, with canons at unisons, they, you want them to be perfectly strict, uh, which is why we start with canons at unisons. So there's always a correlation between the accidentals. You can't have the leader say C sharp and then have the follower not say C sharp, at least in canons at the unison. The canons at the unison are the most strict. Um, the, the other the other versions are that we might look at are canons at the fifth and fourth, which sometimes can actually be exact exact in terms of intervals, and those accidentals are carried perfectly. And canons at the octave, of course. Now you'll see when we get to canons at intervals, the you can be a little bit freer with the accidentals because it's not possible unless you want to like modulate to like Mars or something like that. Um, so that's that's what we're going to study. But with canons at the unison. They have to be perfectly strict, which I know it's brutal to start with that. Um, and Pierre actually has this great piece of advice. It's actually a great segue into my next thing. Um, but do you have any more questions, John? I'm fine. I'm covered. Thank you. Great. So Pierre has this great uh, observation where he said, I found it easier in the second measure if the leader was less busy. Um, and that was actually something I was going to point out to you guys. Um, so. I don't know if this is just like human nature or something, but if I if you tell me I can't have the F, you know, then I really want to have the F in that measure. <laughs> it's very strange. If you tell me I can't have it, like the parents say, don't touch it, and then the kid immediately just touches it and they burn their hand and they're they're, they're really stupid. Um, so what I noticed was that if I can't have the F here, what I tend to do is I tend to have, if I can't have the F here, I tend to have the F here, so that the follower is saying it, so that my leader doesn't have to say it. So you'll notice with this canon, one of the things you'll notice is that this is a really busy first measure. Why did I do that? Um, it's just it's just a little trick uh, because here I could not have the notes E flat, B flat, and A flat. I mean, I, I could not have the notes E, F, and A, right? So I just dumped them all into this measure. I made this really busy and I made this really quiet in the leader. And that's what Pierre is noticing, uh, which is a really deep thing to understand. You'll notice now after the modulation, I can be free here. This is a really busy line. Now I can go to F major. I have to get rid of two accidentals. This is a still line. And here after the modulation, I have a lot of notes going again. And then here is where I can't have a lot of the notes again. I can't have a lot of my goodies. And so I have a really still line, but I dump them all out here. All right, so that's that's just a that's just a writing tip. If you can't have the F in that measure proceeding, maybe have the F two measures proceeding and make it really busy. Uh, I find that's just, you know, it's very superficial and it sounds very banal, uh, but it's just a great heuristic way to think about it. And that, that was kind of my trick in writing this canon, uh, was just to dump all the notes that I couldn't use in the preceding measure. So, <clears throat> great observation here. Any other questions? Yeah, I have one, one just question to Ericsson. Like, doesn't it sound like um, cr uh, cl cr um, clashing or bizarre if it's like the modulation is not prepared sometimes? Uh, for example, on measure three, it can it kind of sound like um, ah, strange. <laughs> like, it, it, it just coming right right away without oh, preparations. Yeah. So I, I don't. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the these these modulations at least. That what I'm trying to demonstrate here is supposed to be very extreme, and I guess okay. it does sound it does sound very bizarre. Um, you know, it's supposed to uh -huh. go right into that. That's like a phrase modulation, okay. and that that can be an effect that you can use. So we're not we're not limiting ourselves to the Baroque here. This, these are just techniques that transcend anything. You could write something in the in you know French Impressionist style with canons and. These kinds of modulations would be great for that. You know, going into chromatic meeting. Um, you know, that's at the bell. It's also uh, Coltrane. Um, so, yeah. 
Any other questions? That would be a great exercise of writing uh, the canon over giant steps. Yeah, just, just I, I, I really appreciate the last time when you show um, how sort of make a plan from the harmonic point of view, because uh, to be honest, I have a lot of trouble to rejoin, I would say, the harmonic way of thinking mm -hmm. with this uh, linear way of thinking in a way. So anything that will help that, it will be like gold for me to just to... Mm -hmm. Well, because yeah, mm -hmm. go ahead. No, no, no I, I was just trying to to make the degrees that will, will allow me to to make a good modulation, but I'm kind of lost still in the in the process of of uh, keeping track of everything at the same time. You know, the how can you go and give the impression that your melody is really free, but you have to put it within the corset of uh, a, a a certain harmonic plan. So it's yeah. it's tricky. It is exceptionally tricky. Well, let's see that what we've got so far are three techniques. All right, and there are three techniques that we have so far. That is, we have the wire, which is pretty much a horizontal, horizontal approach that is goal-based, horizontal goals. We have common tones, which is harmonic or vertical. And now what you also have is this ruler method, right? And I'm not gonna lie, it's really hard to bring all these elements together into the canon, right? Um, but I'll go ahead and just try to demonstrate it real quick. So let's say, you know, I can start with the Y, uh, I'll start with the harmonic, all right? So I'm just gonna think really stupidly here. I'm gonna think, Great voice leading. That's a good step. All right, those triads right there. I'm gonna copy them over in the unison. You've seen this technique before. And I'm gonna change the harmony here. So this was one, four, five, and this is One, four, five, and these are just practical methods. You don't have to use them. I know some people might think of these methods are crazy. But it should be a different approach. All right, and let's say that I'm gonna do, uh, uh, I'm gonna do uh, three lines here. And I'm gonna do that. All right, so not too different. For the harmony, so I'm going to have uh, six, two, five. And I'm going to say that these are my common tones between them. All that, and so that correlates to these guys. It correlates to these guys, and that correlates to all of these guys. Like that. All right. So I have my restricted pitches that I have to use. Now, the other thing is, I'm gonna say that here, I wanna modulate the G major, all right? That also says that I can have no F here in the leader. No F, all right? So I'm gonna go right here. I'm gonna cross out this F. Can't have that F there, all right? That already gives me a lot of information. All right, so I've already used two techniques. I've used two techniques. I'm going to use a third technique. I'm just going to make a goal. So I'm going to say I want to go from this pitch to that pitch. I'm going from this C to that E. Actually, you know what? I can go from that C down to this A. All right. I know that I'm restricted to these pitches. So I'm going to go down a fourth. I'm going to say that this is that. Just my wire frames. Now I'm going to go up to A and I'm going to copy this over now. Go down to F. Notice that I used the F to measure before, so I'm not tempted to use it. All right. 
now I'm going to say that my next goal is just going to be going up to C. I'm going to go up to C. All right, I'm going to be really extreme. Extreme. Have a really extreme amount of time. Just to demonstrate the concept. So this is my wireframe. All right, I'm going to say no F. No F in the meter voice. All right, and now I'm just going to fill out the wire. So. I don't know, I don't want to do that. Keep my head. Alright. Now I can copy this over. Alright. I always like to write out just the note head first. Hold on to this. I'm actually just going to write pretty much what my wireframe says. All right. I know this is a lot of information, but these are just those three techniques that you've learned so far. And now I'm going to have the modulation here. And I'll just copy this over, and you'll notice that this red voice worked in uh, C major, and it's also going to work in G major. And then I'm just assuming that there's a base one. Don't worry about that. I know it's in six form version. I'm assuming that the base would be doing this if I had a base. All right. So let's see what I got here. So I brought three techniques to bear. Now you don't always have to use all those techniques at the same time, but you know if you want to use all of them at the same time, that's great. Uh, but as you're going along, you're writing your can, you might say, "Oh, I'm really having, I'm, I'm struggling with this one little point. Maybe I'm struggling with modulation, or I, I don't have goals, or I'm not controlling the harmony." You can think, "All right, well, I'm just going to take a step back, and I'm going to use one, two, or all three of these techniques." Uh, but did that did that help illustrate how to use these techniques, or did that help answer your question? Did I understand your question? Sure, sure. Thank you. I, I, I think it's a, it's just a. I like the. Um, yes, you, 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 you use the six like the second degree of the new key. Mm -hmm. So, but I think you 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 are doing a lot of steps that you're doing almost unconsciously because you have a lot of practice. But I can see what what you're, what you're aiming at, so to speak. I just I'm not there yet. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, um, do you like chess? Do you ever play chess? I'm a big fan of chess, but I like playing cards. Okay. You great. know, like it's well, sort of. Um, Cas Cas Capa Blanca, Cap Capa Blanca, that's how you say his name, right? Um, uh, he was a great chess master. Um, and they asked him, "How many moves do you think you had?" And he says, "I think about two or three moves, and the rest is all intuition." Um, which you think these grandmasters, they think like twenty moves ahead. No, they only think about two or three. It's just that with practice, you build up an intuition. They call it chess vision. Um, I've played chess enough. I'm, I'm not particularly good at it, but I played chess enough. Juan and I play chess a lot. You just start building up an intuition. And sometimes when it gets really tough, you know, like, okay, I got to do some calculus here. But most of the time, it's just, if you do it enough times, you build up an intuition and you see the moves and you don't have to think too much about it. And it's the same thing with counterpoint, which is interesting because 
I'm still, all, I'm, I'm encouraging you guys to really think a lot of moves ahead still, but also as you do it with more time, you'll realize, oh, that's not gonna work. That's, you know, like, I, you don't really have to think about it. So yeah, you're absolutely right. There's some sub um, subconscious things going on, but it builds up just like chess, which we hate chess, I'm sorry, but. Bobby Fischer actually had a very interesting take on that too, which is basically that you, if there's a lot of different possibilities for each move, then of course you're only going to think a couple moves ahead. But then once you start getting into these patterns where like there's only one best move, then you can think like 10, 11, 12 moves ahead. And it's very similar, I think, with counterpoint, especially with like musical tropes. So the more that you're engaging in like different tropes or you have like solutions where there's might like, you know, I think a lot of the time when Erickson goes so fast, he's sort of seeing the best move per se. And so you can think, you know, eight, nine moves ahead. But then if you have a, you get to a situation where there's like a wild variety of different possible moves, then it's only possible to do one or two or three moves ahead. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a little bit out of practice, actually. I was looking at the, the first video that we did last week. I agree. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but I was looking at the, uh, I was looking at the video that we did last week and uh, I was like, God, the canon is so bad for that. But I would say that, I was when I am in practice and when I go fast, I think the biggest thing that helps me go fast is having really basic, simple, stupid ideas that underpin everything. That's what the wireframe is all about. You just have this really simple idea behind everything. It's great. So yeah, that's my advice. All right. So now we have one more, we have another technique, and this this is a this is a very solid technique. Catenation is chains. Catenation is when you have a chain. So let's say that you have a circle and it comes around and then you chain it at the beginning, at the, at the end and it connects. That's called a chain. And so my question is, what if you had a cannon that repeats like the Goldberg, but let's say that we don't want the cannon to stop. How do we let the cannon continue through the repeat? Any ideas on that? Any, any strategies on how you would do that? Let's just throw it out there. It's questions. I'm going to ask you guys a lot of these questions going forward as well, uh, because it's going to be the basis or a lot of these cannons. So how would you write a cannon that continues to the repeat? Sorry, so you mean you come to the dominant and you want to continue from the start again? Yep. Is and that I, the idea? Yep. I, want the, I don't want the cannon to ever stop. I want it to go right through the repeat, right to the beginning. I mean, then, then you just lose one accidental and uh, you kind of need a figure which moves you one fifth back. Oh. So I would, yeah, it's just like a short transition. Okay, okay, yeah, you, you can think about it that way. I want, I want you to be even dumber, simpler. Uh -huh, okay. Uh, dumb ideas, I love dumb ideas. Well, actually, <laughs> I'll give my, my shot. I mean, you, you only need to, to think about the last phase in relationship to the, to the beginning. It's like uh, how how, it's like uh, users of a reverse. It's like uh, when you are at, at the end, you need to be sure that that what, whatever you're writing is a good counterpoint to the beginning. And, and mm -hmm. yes, I don't know. That's exactly uh, it. That's exactly it. Pretty much just copy and pasting. And and Clement points out a really big challenge is that if you modulate to you know Pluto in the last measure and you got to go back to Earth. Um, how you can reconcile those two, which is something you want to think about ahead of time before you go to Pluto. Um, so, but let's say that we're just going to do a really simple modulation that's one accidental way. So I have this cannon right here. All right. And uh, Juan, would you mind playing it as it is? at the end there's a reason for that all right but all i'm going to do is i'm going to take this boy the very first phase and take this measure all right and all i'm going to do is i'm going to write it up here All right, 
And now what you have to know is that these guys, the relationship between them does not matter, all right? There can be parallel fifths, there can be parallel octaves. It does not matter what's going on between those two, all right? Between this guy and this guy, because they're not, they're not gonna be playing at the same time, all right? Now what I have to do is I have to write a line for the leader that will fit in both of them, all right? So I'm gonna write this. So this, this guy that I wrote just now, gets along with both of these lines, all right? You see that? It gets along with the red line, and it gets along with the blue line from the beginning. Doesn't necessarily, all three of them don't have to get along though. This guy does not have to get along with the red guy, all right? And all I'm gonna do now is I'm just gonna continue the canonic process. I'm gonna take this guy, and I'm gonna copy him into the beginning. All right, did I copy that correctly? Yes, I did. All right, so now, Juan, can you play that again? And don't play the uh, first, you know, you don't play the red the first time around, you play it the second time around. Yes, correct. So I'm gonna set the timer for five minutes again. <clears throat> and what I would love for you guys to do is just to write three or four bars. All right, you're gonna write three or four bars. So these are our four bars. And what you're gonna do is you're going to take the leader that you have and you're gonna put it over the last phase and you're gonna write a leader that works between this the follower, you're just going to have a repeat sign and it's going to be catenated. All right. And if you want to try using the ruler method and modulate somewhere after that and go to the dominant, that would be really cool. So you'll have two techniques that you can use. All right. And I'll keep this up as an example. Set my timer for five minutes. All right. <clears throat> so are there any questions about that concept or how did you do? Do you have any observations, questions, concerns? Alrighty. So um, with that being, with that, um, so those are the four techniques that we're going to cover at every interval. It's going to go much faster than this, I promise you. So I'm going to show you guys how to do wireframes, how to do common tone methods, how to do concatenation, and what was the other one? That, oh, modulation at every interval. Uh, I'm not going to address every interval, but I'm just going to show you how to do it at other intervals and in contrary motion. And we're also going to get into some other really advanced concepts. Now I got one more fun thing to show you if you really want to impress mom and dad and that is cryptic form all right so cryptic form is and we rarely ever have to do it with uh hands at the unison but cryptic form is you take the follower sometimes also called closed form or enigmatic form and we omit the follower get rid of it Raising all of it. And all you do is you just give a clue to how the follower behaves. Now, can at the unison, oftentimes what you can just do is you can just present it like this. And you don't have to say anything. Somebody would just have to say, and some conspiracy theorists would come around and say, oh my God, there's actually a canon at the unison in this that can actually happen. Or you can give them extra clues. So what you can do is you can just present it like this and you can say, you can put in a sign right here. And that means, oh, the canon, sorry, that's how I did my signs. Um, the canon comes in here, right? 
Or what you can do is you can also put another clef that shows the interval relationship between the two cannons. So since this is at a unison, I got to do in the transposition, I put two clefs, two signatures, and if you want, two, piece, uh, two time signatures as well. All right, that's all you have to do. All right, it's a cool little trick. And that's all there is to it. Now we're eventually getting into things that look like this, where you're gonna have this and that, that's if the cannon is at the second. We're also gonna do things like this that uh, are upside down. We're gonna do things where the, you have a cleft over here and then you have a cleft backwards. All right, that's my ugly clefts. Um, we're also gonna do things that have different time signatures like this. We're going to do things that even have different key signatures like this. And uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. And it'll actually sound good. We're going to show you how to do it on a very advanced level. All right, so that's all there is to cryptic forms. You get rid of the follower and you represent it with either an additional clef or instructions. Great. So what we can do now is we'll take a brief look at maybe two canons that people wrote today. And then I'd like to show you guys, just take five minutes of your time to show you guys uh, some examples of canons in the rec. Um, but would anybody like to share their canons from today or any of their exercises? You can choose any one of your exercises and we'll take a look at it. I would just have a, a, a question regarding this uh, chain canon. So this, this means in a bar before the repetition, it means that actually you have to have three voices which, which function together. Well, not together, but you have like two pairs of voices which should function together. Yeah. Like you have the actual music and then you have the the well the the blue one which needs to be well compatible with the start so am i right you have these two two pairs yes okay yes. you have you have two pairs but note that not all three have to work together though yes yes of course but the two pairs have to like one pair and the second yes okay so i got it right thank you very much yeah of course yeah you got those two pairs and you got to write count you got you got to write counterpoint between it's like a, it's like a sandwich mm -hmm. Okay, but let's look at uh, John's. So John is from Greece. Looks beautiful. All right, who wants to read this? Because also fun fact, I'm not really a keyboard player. I'm a violinist. Uh, so who wants to read this? Let's have let's have Pablo go. Oh, awesome! Great. Bravo, bravo, congratulations, John, and uh, great playing, Pablo. Thank you for doing that. Um, great, so there's a lot of, you're, you're, you're at a really great place. Um, everything is stepwise, which is why you're able to get away with so much. Uh, you were able to change the harmony. Um, the red earth was really clear, the white earth was clear. And I loved how you had these really clear directions. So you would descend from, down to E, and then you ended the phrase, and then you had the other the other voice come in. That was really beautiful to actually put the A press there, and then continue. And then you're able to take the cans and replace it with the harmony. So this is all really good work, which is great. And I love how you're thinking in terms of these phrases. This is sometimes students, they, they get too caught up in just spinning the cannon and spinning the cannon. They forget to think in terms of phrases. All right. Now I have some, I have some input on how we can make it a little bit better. Um, first, you don't want to, so rests are really valuable. All right. But you don't want them to be a cheat. Because yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, it's very sparse because first because I was afraid to you know insert many notes. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. It's it's very difficult. Um, so just you know, just ideas on how you can kind of fill out the canon and enjoy the canonic process. You know, just filling this out. Now we'll actually hear a little bit more canonic action going on. All right. 
You know, now we have more counterpoint going on. You know, it just fills it out. So. All right. Now, of course, that would have worked later with your canon. All right. I, I can't go in and do surgery and expect it to work with the rest of the canon, but it's just an example of an idea that you can't have. Of course, we're going to have a clash later with that example. Um, so that, that's just one suggestion. Right? Don't, don't, let the, don't let the rest be a cheat. Um, the other thing is, I think that this baseline here, right here, that, that little figure, I think that's a little bit useless. Uh, the octave loop. Um, I think you should just have it be that, you know, eighth, uh, quarter eighth. Um, but other than that, it's a really good job. So, excellent. Do you have any questions? Um, yeah, yes, uh, you spotted the cheat. So, <laughs> yes, uh, the question would be how, um, uh, I, I, I don't know, it, it might be a matter of imagination because uh, when you played this uh, Dodo Sila, uh -huh. uh, it sounded uh, more uh, flourish. Florist. So yes, uh -huh. practice, practice, I, I guess. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think your canon actually is, it's an excellent place to start though. It shows <laughs> and just really good rhetoric and you did everything. I, I think just me and my experience, this, seeing this descent, how you went from B down to E and how you use the rest in the phrase that really indicates a really strong understanding of an intuition for this music. So I think it shows a lot of promise. So congratulations. Right. And does anybody else have any feedback for uh, John about that? Right. Um, okay, so I got another canon, and that is from, uh, let me see, and that is from Gabe, right? Cool. Was following your uh, wireframe. Yeah, yeah. Oh, this is this is beautiful. I can I can hear my wireframe. That's beautiful, though. Um, so there are some really good things going on here. Um, everything is stepwise. Uh, I'm just looking at how you leap. Um, the leap is the leaps are really good. Um, and yeah, everything's stepwise, and it always sounds good. Um, and I like the directions. Of course, I'm, I'm complimenting all the qualities that are. The wireframe, which is it's difficult to complement <laughs> uh, the wireframe. <laughs> um, but yeah, this you, you, you followed the exercise really well, <clears throat> and I like how you, you you maintain the metaphoric counterpoint of the eight notes, and everything was stepwise. Great job with the wireframe. Um, so I just have some suggestions here, but do you, do you have any questions first? Okay, cool. So what I would say here is first. Um, this leap of the B down to the E is okay, and it definitely happens in the rep. I'm a bit of a stickler for that kind of thing in my own music because you have them crossing voices. When I see that kind of thing, I think, oh, actually, this is an opportunity to go a little wild. Um, I like that you came down here to the, to the E, by the way, to mm. kind of compare the C. That was a nice detail. I know that's not in the wireframe. Um, but that being said, I would actually like it if you came down to the D instead here, which would actually be a very interesting sonority because you would go from this chord. And notice one thing about the wireframe is that the outer voices are always in imperfect consonances unless approached by contrary motion. So this is totally justified because it goes down to six in the outer voices. Beautiful. And you get to use the fob organ, which is something we're going to talk about a lot with the, uh, with the wireframe eventually. So I, I like that fob organ actually. It's just it's just a detail. I don't know if it's it's not really fob organ, but um, parallel first and version ports. Beautiful. So that's just one suggestion about that. Um, yeah, and then everything else is very lyrical and held over. So uh, this is this is really great writing. Um, 
know, I like that you actually justified this leap here in the bass. Because it, let, it came down by step and then you had the resolution there. Usually I'd actually say leaps like that it can be awkward because you're kind of leaping to the fifth underneath the chord, but it's, it's totally justified. So I think this was really well done. It shows a really strong intuition um, for the music because of course you're amazing background. For those of you who don't know, Gabe and I met at EMA in 2017. Um, very fine musician. So yeah. Any questions, Gabe, or does anybody else have questions for Gabe or feedback or floor is open. I'll shut up. I would have a question mm -hmm. uh, regarding the second bar where you said that the 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 boys could leap to D1, so what in, in, in American it's this D4. Okay. So this is only possible because we also have the, the bass line, which is not canonic. Right. right. And okay. It's, mm -hmm. it's possible, in my belief, um, primarily because even though it leaps to D there, it's possible actually because of the imperfect consonant, the fact that the outer voices are sixth. In fact, it's a little bit better because then you actually don't have this leap to the octave, which if you did have this leap to the octave, if, which you do have, I would say actually you have this great opportunity to actually hold the B and create a dissonance. That would be one thing that you could you can consider doing. So I, I would, if you were gonna, if you're gonna do that, I would say just go all the way and change the canon to this, which means that you'd have to go backwards. Um, which might change the wireframe a little bit, but that's okay. You can change the wireframe. I won't get mad. That would be a beautiful opportunity. So if you're going to lead to an octave like that, I think it's always a great opportunity to have a seventh. Um, but in this case, to do honor what he wants. Sorry. I also think it's equal to this one. Yeah. Any other questions about that? Did that answer your question, Clayman? Yeah, so, so it means that, that you, you always need a consonance with the bass. That, that's what I understood from it. Yeah, well, yeah, that's, that's a certain thing that I built into the wireframe that I'm going to talk about in a little bit more detail next week. Uh, those wireframes are designed very strictly. Uh, and it's, it's not even how box cannons are designed. You know, sometimes he has, you know, perfects, perfects with the outer voices that aren't approached by contra motion and stuff. Um, I, I can talk about it just a little bit here, but you'll notice with the outer voices of the wireframes, so we'll take the first one. So thirds and sixes. The outer voices form, uh, which is a real, these wireframes take forever to do because of that requirement. Um, it's a real pain in the ass to get you know, two voices to imitate each other to yield that kind of relationship with the bass. Uh, but you'll find that it's very sonorous because of it or resonant. So, so yeah, that's, that's how these wireframes are. There's a couple other design elements I'll talk about next week. Um, but yeah, are there any other questions about that? Okay, so I want to show you guys just one more thing. And thank you for writing the canons. Um, if you'd like me to take a look at them more later, just message me. Um, but what I want to show you guys is canons in the wild, which I want you guys not to walk away from this just thinking that you have to write canons or only canons, but how you can integrate this into larger forms. So who here is familiar with the Bach mass in D minor? Bach. Awesome, great, yeah. You guys should definitely get to know it. I'm actually currently doing a model on it. Um, and what I would love for you guys to do is uh, go through the arias and get to know the canons that he does in them. So canons have significant religious symbolic uh, meaning behind them. Bach, you know, he, he belonged to a, a society that was about writing counterpoint and stuff. And they would talk about canons are like evocative of 
completeness of God and Alpha and Omega and all this other stuff. So that's why he uses a lot of canons in, in the uh, arias of the Bach Mass, but he uses a lot of canons in general. Uh, but I would like to draw your attention to two arias, and I'm just going to show you guys um, how they work real quick. All right. So can you guys see my screen with these people hanging out? Playing. Okay, cool. All right. Now here is a score. Now this is the Christier Eleison. Eleison, how you pronounce it? All right. So here's the opening Rotinello, and they're doing it. They're 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 singing and they're playing and stuff. And then here we get to a little cannon. All right. And it's a little cannon at the fifth below. And he tends to do this in the development after the initial theme. And uh, and so the soprano is you know the lady on top is singing first and the lady on bottom. All right, now this is a free canon. So these circles help to identify where the canon changes a little bit here. So here we have a leap of a fifth, and here we have a leap of a second, or a step of a second. And so now it becomes a canon of a second down. So it started with a canon of a fifth down, and then a canon of a second down. And then here we have the step up of a second, and here we have the leap down of a fifth. So it's a very free application of canon, but what he is doing is copy and pasting, which is what we do. All right, now all this is written in invertible counterpoint. Which means that all he does is he takes these measures, this chunk of music up to measure 18, and all he does is just flip it around. This is the same exact music, just in the dominant now. And now she's singing the canon on the bottom, and the lady on top uh, sings it, and it's the same adjustments with the canon. And why does he do that? Maybe it's supposed to form like a chiastic structure, evoke the, the cross, the Holy Trinity, who knows? It's what the conspiracy theorists talk about it. All right, and then we have the free counterpoint. And well, the other thing I want to draw your attention to is how the canon starts the phrase, but how the canon breaks at the end of the phrase, and it just ends with that declaration, lays on, have mercy on me. And then we have a second, we have another canon here. Um, it's a canon at the fourth above. It's a little bit different, and then they line up again. And then the canon again right here. Some adjustments are made. But what is important is that he's using the canonic process.
English could be. So that is uh, also I should give them credit, Netherlands Box Society. All right, and now I'm gonna show you one more, same people uh, forming. And this is the eight in unum dominum. What's interesting in this is the words are and in one um, Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten uh, son of the father and everything like that. So eight in unum. And in one, canon at the unison. And then as we expand to Lord Dominum, it becomes a canon at you know, the fifth or the fourth floor, whatever you want to call it. Um, so it expands the, to evoke the Holy Trinity of the triad and everything like that. It's an interesting interesting thing that we can talk about later, um, symbol, symbolism and everything like that in uh, canons. So here is the Etim Unum Dominum. You're going to see lots of canons in this one. So this is from the Nicene Creed. Um, to creed, so it's got to be anthemized, and so of course you use a lot of canons. So you get the point, lots of canons. Um, you'll notice something interesting about that movement that we just listened to, that the words that they were singing were different from the words in the score. That movement has has a whole history behind why that is. I'm actually surprised that they were using the edition that they were, because we can read about it, 
a, it's a whole mess. I actually got screwed over about it a couple months ago because uh, I did analysis of it. It turned out I was doing analysis of the whole wrong thing the entire time. Um, but yeah, any observations? If you already knew the mass or if you already knew this music, did you ever notice the cannons that were happening in it? Um, or do you have any observations about that? I, well, to some extent, of course, you can say there are cannons, but in any case, it's um, music which is uh, imitative. So, mm -hmm. in, the, almost everywhere in Bach, you have these kind of things. So, yeah. the voices come and go, and it's simply mind blowing and amazing how it functions beautifully with the harmony. So, it's. Whew. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. You know, sometimes you have the motivic imitation and everything, but every now and then you have them overlaid where we have to see that it was using the canonic process of copy paste to make it work. Um, but yeah, integrating this, it absolutely, it is absolutely mind blowing how he does that. Um, I, I was thinking, I don't know, do you know that piece by um, Monteverdi, the Vesper of the of the Holy Virgin? I think is in, uh -huh. in English. It's, yeah. it's also, there are really interesting canons on that one. Mm. The language is not as common practice. You know, there are certain things that sound a bit different, but it's still tonal. It's not model anymore. And, and there are some amazing things uh, in, in, in strict uh, canons. Yeah, I, I, yeah. Mont Monteverdi was a big development, actually. It's especially because of the artuzzi Monteverdi debate where you have the unprepared ninth, which was allowed, so you could have... Um, there's a whole debate about that. And it's still, honestly, it's we're still stuck up on it right now. But yeah, it's, it's a whole can of worms. But yeah, yeah, that's, that's great. I, I've never actually analyzed the Vespers. I've, I've heard them. Um, of course, you always have to hear them from music history class. Um, but I, I'll have to sit down and look at the canons. Great. Any other observations about uh, cannons in the wild? Um, I want to say something about um, this last canon that we heard. Um, I mean, when you take a look at it and you see just how many techniques Bach is implementing into the right into the writing process at the same time, it's quite amazing. Like for example, uh, in H one hundred and fifty. He has he li he he leaves a, a lot of room in the voices so he can develop like motori counterpoint in the um, strings. Um, that's one example. Like he also uses tropes and conventions. Like the the first canon opens on a Monte Romanesca, so he's like throwing in all of these. Like okay, I'm gonna take this canon and and build it over a convention, a harmonic convention, and then he is going to like back off and let the voices breathe so he can have motori counterpoint in the strings here he's doing the he's doing the opposite right he has like a more busy voice part and he, the the strings are just like like accompanying lightly and then uh starting on the first page i think no 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 no, no the the, sec the next page sorry the next page not the first page yeah here you have the, the opposite, right? You see how the violins go just like like this, and then the voices have a much much lighter counterpoint. And it's, yeah. it's I mean, it's just such a such an incredible work of art. Yeah, and what's so this we're going to talk about these canons as well. So this this is the existence of two canons at once. So the strings are in canon with each other as well, with the third below, and then this is really amazing because the strings actually have imitation in reverse, in contrary motion. So this guy goes up, down, this guy goes down, up. And it's the same figure, just in contrary motion. And then they're, they're passing it around. All at the same time, while he's juggling this cannon down here. But what? How's he doing that? And he's got to do it You got to do it over the words. He's got to take into account the singers. You know, they got to breathe, all that other stuff. So quite amazing writing. And then it fits into the whole aria form. It's all got to be invertible. Well, not in this case, but most of it is an inverbal counterpoint, so you can flip the voices if he wants later. Um, so yeah, it's a great observation. Uh, I, I wanted to say uh, I've been reading an article that someone that was uh, studying on his compositional process, he noticed in certain places Bach will leave like repeated notes 
and later on fill out the figures. Mm. So I, I, I'm afraid I don't remember which article it was, but but just the information. I think it's it's interesting how, in a way, it, it matches your your idea of why friends, that he thinks like, okay, well, this, this is like a basic idea, and then I want to fill out the figures. So, but when he had the time, he would do that. But in certain, I, what, what he noticed is in certain places, he will leave like repeated notes and then at a later stage, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I, I do that. I do that with the model I'm writing right now. I actually got, I got reprimanded for not writing the words at the same time as the music. But sometimes you just got to leave in basic structures and uh, ornament it and contour it later. Um, so yeah, it's just these different approaches to it. Cool. Is there anything um, else? Oh, yes. Maybe. Yes. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. John. The the canon from the crystallization mm -hmm. remind rem, the first canon of page uh, the first page of the PDF uh, reminded me of another cantata. Uh, I don't remember the name or the number, but it says uh, my zile varet uh, varet holds no long notes, and uh, uh, I and the harmony I think was something uh, similar sevenths, uh, the circle of the fifths. So maybe Bach had uh, cheated in his own way. I don't know. Is this uh, is there a theory, an article possible, uh, talking about um, having. Uh, some harmonies which worked well with certain canons. Oh, yes, yes, I'm glad that you asked that actually. That is a very big topic that we're going to cover in this club. Specifically, <clears throat> you've pointed about the circle of fifths. Uh, what we're going to talk about is the interaction of sequences and certain types of canons, which is really important. And so, for example, I'll challenge you, I'll, I'll posit this challenge to you guys. And, and as we, as we go along, I'm going to give you guys certain challenges to think about over the week, and we'll talk about them. Uh, but I'll just jump ahead and give you this challenge. How would you write a canon at the unison over the circle of fifths without using any dissonances and before the circle of fifths ends? So you cannot use any dissonances. You have to start writing the canon before the circle of fifths ends. It has to be at the unison. There's actually only one right answer to this. And you can think about it. Um, we're going to talk about how that works. We're actually going to talk about it. We're not going to talk about it for a couple of weeks, but it is something to think about. Um, the reason why we're not going to talk about it for a couple of weeks is that we're going to learn how to write other types of canons, and then we're going to apply it to sequences, which is going to be really great, really great and informative thing. And then we're going to get into inventions and fugues, which are going to, inventions and fugues are so easy. Um, in my other club, we're on inventions and fugues right now. Actually, Clement and Cooper can tell you because they're on it, uh, because we've done We've done canons for so long, people can sit there and they can write pretty good inventions in a couple of minutes. So it's pretty good. Um, but yeah, I'm glad that you asked that question, John, uh, because that is a very deep question that we're going to answer. Okay. Well, today was a great session and I enjoyed seeing you guys. And I will see you next week when we will begin canons at intervals. The week after that, canons and contrary motion. All right. See you guys later and message me if you have any questions or any follow up things. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.